Cool, right, we're going to start. So, um, thank you all for coming. I think we're more or less on the dot of eight, which is surprisingly prompt for me. Come in. Hi. <laughs> Take a pew. There's one there by Chrissy. Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about travel photography. It's my first love, my first passion, really, in terms of photography. Um, potted history. I've been a professional photographer uh, since, what, 2011. And in that time, I've transitioned a little bit, started doing headshots, portraits, wedding work, events, and that sort of thing. And I loved it, but I was getting a bit into a routine with it. And the thing that I always grew up looking at were the photographers of life and National Geographic and these adventurers that went all over the world and used their cameras to tell stories. And that really struck a chord with me. And although I was getting quite a name for myself as a, you know, a good jobbing local photographer, and by the way, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It was a terrific part of my career. And uh, it fulfilled me in a lot of ways, but you start to, after a while, um, start to look for what's next. Come in, hi. <laughs> good to see you again, take a pew. And, and for me, that was, that was adventure and it was excitement. Hi Julia, come in, take a pew, there's one there. And so I wanted to explore a little bit more around the world. And I was very lucky because I met Chrissy Kusia, who sat just there with the camera, and uh, Chrissy ran a holiday company, still does, called chrissysgrease.com. And so we went into partnership and we started to offer photography holidays in Greece. And so what I was able to do through that was take my love of photography, which was telling stories and capturing emotions and seeing all this great stuff in the world and be able to go around the world and, and teach in, in all these different places. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what I've learned through that and particularly what I've learned on this latest trip. These photos up here are all from a trip I've just done to Ireland. Uh, we were there a couple of weeks ago and we travelled from Belfast up to the Giants Causeway. It was the first time I've been in the country. I've been all over the world and never been on my doorstep. It was incredible. So I was really pleased to go and see that. Uh, but it, it taught me some lessons which I wanted to convey to you because I think that um, th there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of pressure on new photographers and existing photographers alike uh, about, uh, you know, you should have all this different gear and you should have all these different techniques and you should have a bag full of different tricks. And I really wanted to strip away from that and pare this trip down to the absolute basics. And actually what I found was that by doing that, I learned some lessons which I wanted to share with you. So for this entire trip, uh, I took just one camera. It happened to be a, a camera with a fixed lens, so there was no chance of me even, you know, sort of bailing out and changing lenses. It was just a fixed lens on there. So I used a camera called a, a Fuji X100F. It's irrelevant if you don't know what it is, but it's basically like a little sort of point-and-shoot camera, and the lens on the front of it gives you a field of view roughly equivalent to about 35 millimeter. 35 millimeter, as it turns out, is quite a useful range to be working in. It's the classic photojournalist's length of lens. And it's kind of wide-ish to get a decent amount of stuff in the subject, but it's not so wide that everything gets distorted and weird. And uh, it still allows you to do people work and some close-up work without it, you know, being really barely and distorted. And so you have photographers like Henri Cartier-Bresson, for example, who travelled all over the world. And for his professional work, he used a 35mm for almost all of it. And he would then use like a 90 or something if he wanted to do a portrait. And then for his personal work, he just used a 50 mil and that was it. He wasn't worried about having a million different lenses in his kit bag. He just wanted to get the story done. And so all of this stuff was done on one single lens and everything was done in black and white. Well, OK, that seems arbitrary, but actually what I wanted to do was strip away the decision making process about post-production as well. I wanted to get right down to what I felt about the moment, what I felt about being there and capturing an image and not have to think about the kit. And so... Anybody that knows the story of somebody like Steve Jobs, for example? Like, Steve Jobs would wear the same clothes every day. I mean, I think he had different versions of the same one. I don't think he smelled, but, like, he had, like, a whole range of, like, turtlenecks and blue jeans. And that was his thing. Mark Zuckerberg does the same, and there's a few other people that do this. And it turns out that's quite an interesting way of thinking, because when you strip away the, the, the noise in your mind about what lens should I use, what T-shirt should I wear, what tripod should I bring, should I use a filter for this, should I shoot wide angle, should I do a time lapse, should I shoot in colour or black and white, when you strip away all the noise, all you're left with is signal. And the signal is the pure feeling of why you were taking that photo, which is hopefully then transmitted into your work. So I wanted to talk about this today. Come in, guys, take a pew. And so I wanted to kind of beetle through some of the photos that I took. And, by the way, this isn't meant to be sort of dogmatic, that you should go out and then you shoot with one lens and you should always shoot in black and white. There's a photo at the end which kind of blows that, because there's no reason to be dogmatic. There's no reason to say, well, I'm only going to shoot in black and white because it's black and white and I'm doing a black and white thing and there's no... No, like if there's a shot that demands colour, then shoot colour. 
like you know who cares right but 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 the point is to kind of strip away unnecessary decision making process so it was wet when we got to ireland uh, we flew into belfast and it was it was wet and we, we were pleased it was wet because it's ireland it was the first time i'd been to ireland i think it was the first time you'd been to ireland too chrissy and so clearly you want the first time you're in ireland to be kind of wet and gray because that's how you imagine ireland to be and well it was so this is a, a place called the dark lane i think it's called um, and it had these beautiful old trees which have been there for, since medieval times. It was featured in Game of Thrones recently. And it, for me, is like archetypal of that part of the world. The rural, rugged landscape coming together with the cloudy sky is something that all seemed to come together in this particular point. And that's why it's famous with tourists and movie directors alike. And so these are the kind of rural scenes that you see. It's a beautiful landscape. It's tranquil. And there's like hardly any human stuff in it at all, except for these sort of fields and bits and bobs, but there's nothing really to sort of disjoint your eye uh, about the landscape. It's, yes. it's very beautiful. Sorry, can, we, can these spots go on? Uh, yeah, yeah, can, we can do, definitely. Is that getting in the way? Let's see what we can do. Yeah, good shout. Uh, it does say spots. I'm pressing it and nothing's really happening. Oh, hang on, let's try that. There we go. Marvellous. Let's turn these down a bit as well. Uh, no, there we go. Is that better? Yeah. Are we winning? Marvellous. Cool. So, um, 35 mil is a comfortable length to work in for more or less all these things. If you want to get further away, you just use your feet. You go that way. And if you want to get a little bit zoomed in, you use your feet and you go that way. You have to sort of think about these things in terms of moving yourself around the scene. And that allows you to interact more anyway. Because by stepping back yourself, you're then getting a different perspective, not just with the camera, like if you're zooming in and out, but you get a different perspective yourself and you get to see things that you wouldn't have otherwise seen. And so moving in three dimensions throughout the scene is useful. The other thing about shooting with one particular focal length is that if you do it enough, you start to see where those lines are on the edge of the, 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 the frame before you pick the camera up to your eye. And that's a tremendous shortcut in terms of framing because it means you can already be sort of ducking down or standing up or walking close as you're approaching your scene. And so your brain in this really analog and, and sort of interesting way starts to read the world in terms of being 35 mil, in terms of being 50 mil, in terms of being 21 mil. It actually starts to, you start to burn in these frame lines, a little bit like the old rangefinder cameras or the old film cameras that had this kind of like sort of like glowing like frame line around the outside of where you take your picture, like you kind of start to see that. I mean, you don't really see that if you do see a doctor, but like the point is you can kind of start to re like visualize where the edges of the frame are and, and start to get shots which are quite natural. This is another shot of, of Ireland, really. This is just a road that, that leads through County Antrim and with all the rain coming in off the top of the, the clouds. You'll see the juxtaposition with the second half of the shots which wasn't like this weather at all, but I was glad I at least got some of it. And this to me is like just so much island. It's, it's the animals, it's the, the, the horses and the sheep and the cows and the goats and all that kind of stuff. It's such a beautiful and rural landscape. And he's close-ish to me and he kind of came up because he thought I might have some peppermints, I think. But he was quite keen to come up and say hello. And as a consequence of the wide-ish lens, it meant that I could get him and also his environment in there as well. So then we headed up to Giant's Causeway. Um, you know, who's been to Giant's Causeway? Show of hands. It's just an amazing place. I mean, I'd never been there in my life and it seems bizarre to me that that place wasn't done by something sort of sentient. Like the fact that these completely regimented blocks go on forever and ever. I'm pretty sure those giants were really good builders. So I wanted to get a sense of, you know, the scale of it and the simplest thing to do that would be to have people in it as well so that you get a sense of the landscape. So you, you're trying, if you've got something like stones, if you just shoot the, the ground with the stones on it, it's like, well, cool, but is that stones that are really massive and like, you know, far away, or are they like smaller stones that are like really close? Um, so if you, put some, if you put some people in there as well, that will give you, give you a sense. And at no point did I feel like I was missing out, by the way, at this, uh, you know, th throughout this. I, I didn't feel, if I wanted to go and shoot something over there, I just walked up to it. You know, I shot lots of different things. I shot a few panoramas with this lens as well. So you, you do have options. You know, if, you, if, you, if, if you're feeling limited by just having one focal length, you know, shoot some panoramas, either, either horizontal like that to cover in more like that, or you can do big sort of uh, stitched images. So you can go along like that, and then that way, and then that way, and then that way, and make up a three by two grid you know, with lots and lots of pixels in it, you can stitch it together these days in, in post-production pretty easily, like it's a touch of a button in a lot of bits of software, and um, give yourself some very different uh, depth of field effects and things like that. Um, 
this, was, this just made me laugh. This, this, to me, kind of summed up that part of rural Ireland. It's like you've got sort of green and stone walls and all that sort of stuff everywhere with this random bit of human stuff in the middle of it. God only knows if this telephone was linked up or something, but it was put there at some point. It's on the edge of the Giant's Causeway. And I don't know if, you know, these days, whoever sees a phone box anywhere, let alone one coming out of a grassy knoll. But, but that, to me, sort of summed up Ireland. It told a little story in itself about, you know, just these little bits of humanity just plumped down into this wilderness this landscape, I just thought it was really interesting. And I was trying to tell some stories about what the landscape's like. And um, it looked like, like, like sort of, you know, those, those shots from like the Martian rover, like that kind of thing. It kind of looks otherworldly to me. It's just a, just a fascinating place. Um, and then I think that was a Martian. Might be a caterpillar. Don't know, I'm not a botanist. But anyway, he was there. And I like the fact that he had all these, because uh, it was raining, so you can see all the, the raindrops in his whatever they are, spikes or some stuff. And then just wherever you do si find signs of humanity, they're all kind of like timeless. And that was another reason that I really enjoyed shooting in black and white there is because a lot of these shots, you can't really tell what century that they're in. I mean, okay, so the phone box, you might assume that's 20th century, fine. But like, you know, when in it, it could be a spectrum. And, and with this, it could be any time from the 19th onwards, I suppose. And I, I really like that about the place. And there were lots of these little corners where they're just interesting and old and kind of decayed looking. And that to me is fascinating and, and went with two things. One, it went with the, the sort of black and white uh, th that I'd chosen to do. Like they, they became self-reflective. The, cho the choice to go in black and white and then the things that I, were looking, I was looking at. Like mentally, I think I was starting to look for things that had that slightly timeless feel. And so this is something that you can think about is that if you, if you start to give yourself limitations, it helps in some way funnel what your story is going to be. That might be helpful to you, it might not. It might subvert from what your story is. And if you have a story pre-planned in your mind and, and you want to do that and, and shooting, in, like if you're shooting like red London buses and you've decided to yourself that you're only going to shoot in black and white, maybe you're an idiot, I don't know. Maybe it's a genius idea, but, but, but don't, don't ever sacrifice your story to, like this is what I'm saying about don't be dogmatic about this stuff. But at the same time, sometimes uh, starting out with, with, with very simple a very simple premise about how you're going to shoot will start to inform the types of things that you look for. You're, you start to see not only the sort of frame of where that 35mm or 23mm or whatever it is lenses, but you also start to see the world in, in black and white or, or in sort of ultra vivid or, or you know, desaturated or whatever it happens to be. Um, and it's also good, uh, the 35mm, for, for taking little candid shots of people. This was in the B&B that we stayed in and this was just one of the other guests and he was just lovely... Lovely Irishman, he helps us out a lot actually after we'd taken his picture and well he noticed after a while because photographers can't just take one can they so eventually he looked up and he had the paparazzi. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> click, 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 click. So um, eventually looked up um, but in the meantime he was enjoying his full Irish breakfast there and the 35mm lens again it was, you know I didn't feel like that was too much or too little it allowed me to get a little bit of the scene in there it allowed me to get him um, and uh, and, and it meant that I, I, could, I could just very quickly go up and take the shot and come back down again. I wasn't worried about zooming in and out to get the frame. I wasn't worried about, oh, well, okay, like last night I was shooting birds. I've got like a 600 mil lens. I'm right, I've got to get that off. And like, where's the other lens? And, you know, it's nonsense. Like, you, you just want, you want all that stuff to be out of your way. You want to be, sometimes you want to just have the simplest gear that you can possibly get. And that will just help you in so many ways. I can't even tell you. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not advocating that you should go out and sell all your gear. And I'm not advocating that you should only ever use one lens because that would be stupid, right? You know, there's, there's sort of nuance to this. And so, you know, there's obviously reasons why different lenses exist on the market. You know, otherwise, all camera manufacturers would just make one lens and we'd all use that. And we don't. And so there are things... Like, if you want to go and shoot wildlife... You know, like with a, with a, with a 35 mil lens, you know, if you're good at jumping, maybe, you know, I don't know, you can catch the birds. But otherwise, you know, there are there's reasons for other stuff. What I'm saying is that if you if you if you if you simplify your gear and then go out and shoot what you can with that gear, as opposed to imagining all the different shots that you could possibly take once. If you had a bag full of all the gear in the world, then you will focus much more on on the photo than on the equipment. Um, just another shot of wilderness, really. It was, it, was a, it was a wild landscape, which was odd because the thing that struck me most about Northern Ireland was how small it was. Like, we flew into Belfast, and I sat in the rental car in, in, the, in the car park and, and put... We were going to go up via Antrim and to the, lake, to the lock there. So I put Antrim in, thinking it was like, I don't know, maybe an hour's drive or something. It said, Antrim, six minutes. <laughs> so it's like, oh, OK. 
Um, but nevertheless, it had this beautiful tranquility and, and sort of wilderness, which I wanted to capture through these photographs. It was a landscape of friendly people, but isolationist environments where you had solitary little crofts, solitary houses, solitary little animals going around the place in this magnificent, beautiful landscape. And I wanted to convey some of that um, through the pictures. Um, so something a bit different now. Then we went to Galway down in, in the south on the, on the west coast and the weather brightened up. These people aren't lunatics. It was actually quite sunny and, and warm and they were jumping into the sea and, and swimming um, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so this was taken from the top of a dive tower looking down and there was another platform underneath and he's just leaping off and they've already done it. And, and again, like, you know, it was, it was perfectly possible to use just that one fixed lens and I, I didn't feel the necessity to get in any closer. Um, and even doing a shot like this, you know, like a, a lot of people would have seen them jumping off that tower and, and immediately got for it, reached for a zoom lens and racked in so you could kind of zoom in on him. Um, but I didn't have that option and maybe I would have done that too. But I actually like the fact that you've got the queue of people that are coming up there and you've got these kids that are going to climb up there and you get to see the sort of texture of the decay and a bit of the water and, and all that stuff. And, and sometimes, like this was probably not a shot I would have thought to take in this way. But because I didn't have any choice, if I wanted to get that shot, I could go there or I could walk into the water and I didn't want to do that. So it informed the type of shot that I was going to make. Um, this one again, like, you know, this little dude sitting out here, you know, I would have probably, I'd have probably zoomed in and got him there or something. And I don't know, maybe it would have been a better shot. Maybe you could see some of the detail of him. I like it like that. I like the sense of space around him and he's kind of looking into it. And just again, it was the sense of this sort of, you know, this lonely landscape, this beautiful landscape, but where there's this sense of tranquility and oneness within a, a, a sort of empty and, and, and breathing space. Um, so I took two versions of that shot. That was a sort of action shot. He, after a while, he got fed up sitting there being all zen and leapt in, maybe to go and get an ice cream. I don't know. Um, this shot, uh, again, all taken with the same thing. And you think, well, OK, it's a lighthouse. So what? There's a story behind the lighthouse, though, and there's a story behind the shot that I took to get it. And the lighthouse, um, after the potato famine, uh, this was the last, the light from that lighthouse was the last light that the people on the boats that were being evacuated to go to America and to come to Britain would have seen of home. Many of them didn't see that again. So it's a very poignant thing. And just on the jetty up there, there's a monument to them. And so I really wanted to go and see this lighthouse. And so, you know, we could see it and it was on this other jetty and it looked like it was, there was like a walkway that went out and it went kind of like a mile out. So we were like, right, okay, we'll walk down there and then we'll go and see the lighthouse. Anyway, we got to the end of it, and right at the end, there's a massive sewage plant. Like I said, there's all these security gates and um, security cameras and all this sort of stuff. And I probably shouldn't tell you this because it's not, it probably wasn't legal. But what I did was I climbed up on top of the wall, the, the perimeter wall that went around. And I literally, like this, along this kind of like 20 foot perimeter wall, like past the CCTV cameras, like all the way around that way. All around, and the wall goes there like that, and then the, the, the plant is there. <coughs> And um, wobbling around in the breeze and trying not to die or be arrested, I managed to get two frames of this before I lost my bottle and then went down. And then on the way back down, uh, the, the security guards had obviously tripped the alarm or something and they were in this van walking, like zooming back up and they went past me and I, I took my hat off so they wouldn't recognise me and went down like that. And the thing that saved me was that at the other end, I climbed up one side of the fence and on the other side of the fence, sitting on some rocks, with these two girls by the gate. And I think the security guard got distracted chatting up the girls and then forgot about me, so I got away. <laughs> so um, that was a story of that. But it had a story behind the, the face and, and of the, the place, which I think kind of makes it. Um, you can do portraits with a 35 mil lens. Who knew? Um, and this is what I was saying about don't be dogmatic. Uh, this, uh, this statue's in Galway and it's opposite the big Catholic cathedral that's there. And the day before it didn't have this red scarf on it. And the red scarf there was um, because of the, uh, the, the uh, Irish referendum on abortion that was taking place. And so they were just put up there um, as, as part of the no campaign. And um, so this actually was only there for that day. The referendum was taking place the next day and then that was taken down again. And so, um, so you know, I wanted to take it and I wanted to take it in colour because, well, you know, why would you take it in black and white? Like the whole thing is about the colour of it. And it told a story and anchors it into a particular point in history. And uh, no, it's not selective colour, by the way, I'm not a fan of selective colour. You can actually see there's some green to on the statue. It is a colour photograph. It just happens that it's a, a black and white photograph. Uh, sorry, a colour photograph with some you know, black and white rocks on it. So that's it. That's the, that's the little journey that we took through Ireland with a single lens um, and a single camera and some of the lessons that I learned from that. And I think the biggest take home for me is, is, is to not get, uh, not to get pressured into 
uh, getting gear that, that, that you feel you ought to have. Like, don't, don't think that the thing that will make you a better photographer is the fill in the, the like you know the next lens the next body you know some more megapixels better autofocusing better in low light maybe getting a carbon fiber tripod because the aluminium one's too heavy or you know maybe getting a, a set of new filters or, or or whatever it is take if you if you want to take some more accessories if you really 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 want to spend your money on amazon if you really want to do that buy spare memory cards and spare batteries please just buy those things and everything else don't worry about it don't worry about it. You know, the thing that, that you will hone as your photographer brain more than anything else is, is, is how you interpret the visual landscape and, and, then, and then how you feel about that. And being sort of self-aware enough to know what it is that you're taking the photograph about and why will far outweigh going and getting a billion, squillion, million lenses or the latest flagship camera from Leica, Canon, Sony, Fuji, whoever. So that's it. Thank you very much. The next thing is Q&A.